You know what that theme is from on Keep It Real with Alexander Garrett? You know what that theme is from? The Bronx is burning. The story of 42 years ago in 1977 when the Yankees were on fire, the city was on fire, blackouts happened like this past July happened in New York. I mean, this was a crazy time 42 years ago. And uh, I just felt like playing it because this Yankee team looks very, 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 very good. And uh, it's it's very cool because the Bronx is on fire again with the team that's 100 wins in looking for the best record in the American League. And who is managing them? Who is managing this New York Yankee team? Well, I'll let John Zerling and Charlie Steiner tell you. Now we're tied at five as we go to the bottom of the 11th. Here's Aaron Boone to lead off. His first at bat of the game. There's a fly ball deep to left. It's on its way. There it goes. And the Yankees are going to the World Series. Aaron Boone. That's right. Aaron Boone with the big homer in game seven of the ALCS in 2003. Well, I wonder if people thought that'd be the only history that he'd make because obviously he heard his. I think he's tore his ACL or whatever, playing basketball, ended his baseball career after this amazing walk-off, led the way to A-Rod. But guess what? Aaron Boone is once again in pinstripes, if you haven't noticed. He's been leading this team through injury, through bad umping at times, through anything possible to a solid 100-plus win year. Uh, 100 win year so far. Last year, they got to 100. It was a very different kind of 100. This year... Without Stanton, without Judge, without Arshella, without, well, without uh, Didi at times, too. Guys like DJ LeMahieu. Guys like that, uh, like Gio Arshella. Guys like, of course, Gleyber Torres, Gary Sanchez, and uh, Cameron Maben to a point. And without Aaron Hicks, Gardy as well. And so all these different talents have been contributing to a 100-win season. And if you thought that homer was indicative of the career of Aaron Boone's playing career, well, it's a very big moment. But how about his managing career? Because according to Brian Hoke, you're on keeping with Alexander Garrett, according to Brian Hoke, the second-year manager for the Yankees, who, as I mentioned, led them to 100 wins last year, well, he made history again last night. Because by clinching 100 the 100th win of the year, back-to-back years, he became the first manager ever in Major League history to win at least 100 games in each of his first two seasons. So Aaron Boone from that homer, wow. And then Aaron Boone with the 200 win seasons or more. Congratulations, Aaron Boone. And, and it's very cool that Mayor de Blasio, Mayor Bill, who happens to be, by the way, a big Red Sox fan, he actually congratulated the Yankees. And uh, he said, and it sounds like he's been following the team. Uh, Of course, he's the mayor of New York, but he's been campaigning everywhere uh, with a failed presidential run. That being said, what he said was really intriguing to me. Because he said, Today, after the Yankees clinched the division last night, he said this. Congrats to the Yankees on clinching the AL East. I gotta admit, they overcame a lot of injuries and put together an incredible season. So this is a Red Sox fan praising the Yankees. And I just say, hey, Mayor Bill de Blasio, Attend the playoff game since you've smartly dropped out of the race for president. Be part of New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Be part of it. Experience October in the Bronx with your fellow New Yorkers that you love to talk about all the time. Well, in October, for 21 of the last 25 postseasons, there has been a baseball game in the Bronx. For 21 of the last 25 postseasons. For the Yankees and Major League Baseball and then the Bronx. So I said, come on, Mayor. Be part of this and be part of the atmosphere of October. 
It's your city. You have to be there. Bloomberg was a Red Sox fan, but he was there. Rudy, of course, was Rudy. And he uh, he's there almost every game still, sometimes. But because you're dropping out of the race, Mayor Bill, come to a game. See how fun baseball in October is in New York. And just get over that. You're the mayor of the city for another term, as of a couple of years ago. Embrace everything about the city, including the fact that the Yankees, for the 21st of 25 years, have made the postseason. But they do it convincingly this year. No wild card game, straight to the playoffs as a division winner. Come on. And yes, you had the uh, Herman, Domingo Herman disaster. Terrible situation there. He's on administrative lead. Won't pitch the rest of the year, by the way, including the postseason, because slapping his girlfriend in the public eye. Oh, and by the way, in front of a commissioner, official of the Major League Baseball office. An official, not Commissioner Manfred. So Ramon's gone, and I can't imagine what a topsy-turvy 24 hours or 48 hours it's been in the Bronx. Remember, they had an emotional ending for... CeCe Sabathia in, uh, on Wednesday night after four innings when they took him out in the final home. Regular season start for CeCe Sabathia, who is retiring at the end of the year. Then you had to try and win the game. You lose 3-2. to two. You're in that clubhouse till the Rays Dodgers are done in the wee hours of the morning, Thursday morning, only to see the Rays winning, setting up another chance last night, and the Yanks do it. Homers by DJ LeMayhew, Brett Gardy with a couple RBIs. I mean, this team looked like it's supposed to last night for a convincing win number 100. A convincing 100-plus win year. So, Mayor Bill, put your gripes aside that you're a Boston fan in New York, whatever. Go to the game. Go to a postseason game, Mayor Bill, because... If you're really going to be back in the city, be back in the city. No more seven-hour work week. No more shunning Yankee Stadium. Be at the stadium whenever you can and enjoy it. Enjoy it. This is October. This is baseball. This is the best part of the year. Opening day is great, but this part of the year, when you hit postseason, the fall crisp weather, man... It gets my blood excited just thinking about MLB postseason back in the Bronx. And it should get your blood boiling too and excited as well. So I guess I take the podcast waves and say, hey, go to the stadium, Mayor Bill. It's time. Put away your grievances with the Yankees. Experience October with all of us here in New York. Be a true New Yorker. Be a true New Yorker. And and work with Donald Trump. Work with President Trump. Because the more we work with him, I think the better off we'll be. Everybody around him, Democrat-wise, wants to go against him. Wants to go against everything he's doing. And yet, I have some thoughts on the whole whistleblower thing. Identity yet to be revealed. Complaint hasn't been shown publicly. And we don't know what's happening with this. But I tell you, uh, you might think I'm kind of crazy. But I tell you, when he says something like this, I, I tend to believe President Trump. I've had conversations with many leaders that are always appropriate. And anything I do, I fight for this country. I fight so strongly for this country. And so, there you go. Appropriate conversations. Meanwhile, you listen to what Joe Biden had to say recently about his son and the prosecutor against his son, Hunter Biden, in Ukraine. I I, I was... Not I, I, but it just happened to be that was the assignment I got. I, I, I got all the good ones. Uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine. And 
Um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired. So that's scary, right? So Joe Biden admitting that he got a prosecutor fired, and yet all CNN talks about is how Trump wanted uh, Biden's son to be investigated. Yet Joe Biden got someone fired for not investigating Hunter Biden. I mean, for uh, he got someone fired for not dropping the investigation. If that's not creepy, if that's not scary to you, that he had that much power, $1 billion worth, to get someone fired, yet these complaints we don't know about, then you're on the wrong track. See, because if Joe Biden's admitting, yeah, I got someone fired because they wouldn't, they would not drop the case against my son. It's the same tactic with the admission scandal. Get my kid in here now. Or we're going to pull the funding from your university. Yet everybody wants to talk about what Giuliani and Trump are saying. And that's not getting to the truth of the matter now, is it? Is it CNN? Is it MSNBC? Is it any of the mainstream? No, it's not. No, it's not. So maybe you should download that audio bit where Biden admits to getting someone fired for refusing to investigate his, refusing to drop the investigation against his son instead of worrying about what the Wall Street Journal is saying about Trump and the Ukrainian president. Because getting someone fired is worse than actually asking to be investigating the son. That's just my take. Maybe that's not yours. Alex.Garrett21. Alex.G-A-R-R-E-T-T-21. Yahoo.com is my email. Now, one other thing I'm hoping to have him on my podcast. Myron Ebel wrote an interesting article for the Washington Examiner about how the... Uh, the climate change. And Myron talked about how there were doomsdayers, not just in this century, but in the 70s and 60s and whatnot. And Myron, amazingly, you're able to join me on the phone right now. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Alex. So you, you write this in the Washington Examiner about how there have been predictions for doomsday with climate change for years. Have there not been? Yes. And in fact, on our CEI open market website, uh, we have a long post which has uh, copies of the actual news clips from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and earlier in this century. So you can go through and, and actually read the news story where Paul Ehrlich said, uh, you know, if we don't change our ways, we'll all be blue steam in 20 years, or uh, the various predictions of, of global famine, uh, the predictions of uh, global cooling and all the disasters that will flow from that. And so this is this has been going on for a long time. These uh, scientists and experts uh, whipping up interest in the in the media uh, by making um, what turn out to be uh, hilariously wrong predictions about 
disaster and catastrophe right around the corner. Now, you are uh, Myron Ebell, the director for Senator, Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, CEI, and you write for the Washington Examiner. And I, I would say there are a lot in your community that are against the whole climate change narrative. Is that right? Well, I think, um, you know, it's very difficult to look into climate science very far without becoming skeptical at at least about the, the 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 extreme predictions that we only have 10 years or we only have five months or we have 50 days or, you know, um, or that that uh, all the Arctic ice will be gone in uh, in a few years. So that, that prediction of the Arctic ice cap over the Arctic Ocean will be gone in a few years. That's been made repeatedly over the last couple of decades for about five years ahead. And, of course, every time it's turned out to be untrue. So, uh, and you get the same thing about sea level rise and how it's going to speed up. Well, it hasn't sp- speeded up. Uh, about how how many degrees warmer it will be in 10 or 20 years. Well, it's only a tiny fraction of that. Uh, and so, it's it's hard not to become somewhat skeptical of these uh, of these uh, apocalyptic claims or 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 uh, cat- uh, catastrophe claims. Myron, I've, I've got a question. So obviously there were a lot of kids and, and workers striking today for climate change. That must sound and, and look bizarre to you. Do, is it, isn't it bizarre? Well, it is. You know, um, human beings have, um, human societies have survived all kinds of uh, environmental challenges and climate changes. And um, most of those were before we had modern technology, modern energy, or the the, the great wealth that our, our societies have now. So uh, the idea that we can't somehow adapt to a little bit of bad weather or a little cooler weather or a little warmer weather uh, seems to me kind of silly. I mean, if if warmer were so bad, why why aren't people retiring in North Dakota and South Dakota and uh, Michigan and uh, Wisconsin. No, they're they're retiring in Arizona, Southern California, uh, you know, Florida. Uh, that's because warmer is healthier. Right. And so the the idea that you know a couple degrees warmer, uh, and and I think that's I don't think we're ever going to get to to a couple degrees warmer in in the next century. But let's assume we do. I, I don't think it it has any uh, there are any insurmountable challenges uh, that will be you know just of such a magnitude that we can't handle them now you are a scientist as well so do you get pushback yourself when you write these no. articles oh, hang, the- hang, hang on Alex I'm not a scientist no no we do have a scientist now on staff for the first time uh, we wow. we brought on board uh, a, a very well-known climate scientist named uh, Patrick Michaels uh, and he, in fact, is in New York uh, or, or on his way to New York uh, to engage in a climate debate put on by the Heartland Institute on Monday evening uh, for the UN uh, to coincide with the UN Climate Summit. So, uh, so we do have a climate scientist, and we we take our our uh, uh, you know we get our advice from him about what what's right, what's real, and what's unreal in the climate debate. Well, you know, and next week, of course, <clears throat> is the UN. Assembly. So what do you think of the forums going on with the Democrats? I don't know if you get political with this, but do you feel like these forums are helping or hurting hurting these candidates? Well, uh, I have have to stay out of electoral politics. I work for a nonprofit group, and I I can't campaign for anyone. Understood. First of all, there was the CNN town hall, which lasted seven hours, and now there's the George, this week there's the Georgetown University and MSNBC uh, climate forum, which lasts two days. So CNN gave each candidate 40 minutes. The the Georgetown one is giving each candidate, and they've invited quite a few more. Uh, is giving each one an hour. Uh, I'd say first of all, if you want to drive CNN's ratings any lower, uh, then uh, the the climate town hall was the way to do it. Uh, it was incredibly boring. Um, most of the people, uh, almost all the time, had no idea what they were talking about. And um, as far as whether it hurts or helps, well, I think uh, it, it, their campaigns, it seems to me that uh, some very radical um, absolutely uh, 
uh, programs for addressing climate change have been proposed. And if you if you tot up all of the predicted damages from global warming, uh, it's less in, in dollar terms than the cost of some of these programs. So, uh, you know, in this case, this is one of those cases where I think the the uh, prescription that is being offered for solving the the problem is actually worse and more expensive than the problem. It will do more damage to our society uh, in terms of making us poorer in removing access to energy for that we use for heating and cooling our homes, lighting lighting the, uh, all of our buildings, and uh, transporting us around. Uh, uh, the country, it will do much more damage to all of those things than uh, a bit of global warming will. So even even a lot of global warming will. So so it's funny. It's 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 uh, from a cost benefit perspective, we'd want to take the the climate damages rather than the policy damages. And and uh, so it's true. Now, if 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 people really thought and looked deeper into this. Are you that they wouldn't be marching? I mean, I don't think they would be anyway. But I feel like people who are marching today and over the weekend just are kind of blind to the other side and don't want to see that other side of how much harm a Green New Deal could be to this economy and whatnot. Yes, I think though a lot of the marchers are very well intentioned. I think some of the leaders and some of the uh, the thought leaders and and also some of the political leaders are are less well intentioned. I think that they're. Their motives can be questioned on several grounds. Um, you know, one. You know, I work for a free market group. We're very uh, kind of libertarian and conservative, and right. uh, we like. We think that the uh, the answer to a lot of our problems is less government, uh, uh, and less government spending, and less government, particularly less government regulation and control over the market and over people's lives. Whereas all of these programs, uh, if you get right down to it, they're almost all about increasing the size of government, increasing the regulatory scope of government, and really becoming very intrusive uh, into pe- how people live their lives, what kind of energy they can use, how much energy they can use, whether they can own a car, what kind of car, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I, 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 do, I do think the people marching are well-intentioned, but I don't uh, I, I, the, the leader, the movement leaders, I think less so. Well, and I, I'd agree with that. So, you know, I've also been thinking as we're talking how there have been man-made disasters that that just have altered things that no one's being held accountable for. My the most recent I can remember is the EPA leaking into a, you know the rivers in Colorado, and no one cared about that. I, I don't get it. I don't get why if they care so much that. A previous administration messed up, and they don't want to hold them accountable. I don't get the double standard there. Yes, uh, some some problems. Uh, I think the mainstream media uh, uh, chooses to ignore, and others they choose to blow out of proportion. You know, there was a report this week about how many billions of birds, uh, how many how many billions fewer birds there are in North America today than there were. A few decades ago, and it, it, the I forget the percentage decline, but it's they think they estimate that the, the the total bird population in the United States has declined really significantly, uh, and this is this is should be worrying, but nobody seems to be worried about building tens of thousands of windmills all across the country, which just uh, kill. Uh, Kill the birds, know, old numbers of birds and bats. So you know, and including endangered birds and bats. So uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, there's something odd going on here about the things we choose to notice and the things that we uh, conveniently ignore. Now, how often do you write for the Examiner? Because I know uh, this is one of the first time seeing you there. But can people continue to read you there at the Washington Examiner? Uh, no, I, I write kind of hit and miss in various publications. So I think uh, you you have to look at the CEI website, cei.org, okay. where we often have um, uh, you know a list of articles by by me and other people here, and also our we have our uh, blog called Open Market, which I uh, sometimes write for. So and we have a bunch of uh, smarter people here who. Okay. Uh, write more than I do. So uh, I would encourage people to look at CEI.org rather than uh, the Washington Examiner. 
Now, that is, as a reminder, the Center for Energy and Environment Competitive Enterprise Institute. So, obviously, you guys want to compete in the energy field. And I feel like the Democrats don't want even any competition. They just want us to remove all kind of energy. Yes, we believe that the uh, the solution to many problems is uh, letting uh, people, uh, free people in a free market, use their ingenuity and respond to, to market demands or, or signals and provide things that people want. And we think that usually people are a better judge of what's good for them and what they want than the government is. So uh, so we believe in competitive markets. So we believe in getting uh, government out of the way. And in particular, we think that, uh, you know, laws are one thing and regulations are another. And we have we have plenty of laws in this country, but we have way, way, way too many regulations that limit people's ability to do things, well, was, including create, create economic wealth. I was going to ask you about that because I, when I first started to really say, okay, this is a scam by the Democrats, was when I saw thousands and pages of regulations against all these energy, against the coal companies. And, and I'm just like, this isn't a ploy to benefit the earth. It's a ploy to bring in money to the Democratic Party. And that's also uh, disheartening to me because if you really care about the environment, you wouldn't try to profit off it. Uh, yes, a lot of the uh, uh, environmental movement, and, and particularly the um, the global warming uh, movement, is really all about transferring wealth or redistributing wealth uh, and uh, to, to various favored special interests. So you drive the coal industry out of business, but you give a tax credit to uh, people who build windmills, and you give a tax credit to people who put up solar panels, and you... Uh, you mandate some states mandate a certain percentage of wind power and solar power. Uh, there, there's no federal mandate, but there is a federal mandate for ethanol uh, rather than using uh, gasoline. Which, you know, uh, you know, I have nothing against ethanol, but I don't think it should be mandated. I think uh, people should uh, decide whether they want to buy a product uh, with ethanol in it or one that's all gasoline. And uh, so, I, you know, I. I just think, uh, yes, uh, well, I, Alex, I'd agree with you that there's a lot of special interests involved in this uh, in this great uh, global warming uh, movement. And I, I wish people would open their eyes to that. Now, here in New York, obviously, we have a mayor who is very progressive, wants to even ban steel skyscrapers. I mean, this is how far the real left wants to go. Am I wrong about that? Well, I, yeah, and I, I was kind of sorry that uh, Mr. de Blasio um, dropped out of the um, uh, the presidential race, but as someone uh, commented in the media, I didn't know he was running. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, the, the California and New York and uh, to some extent, uh, I suppose, Washington and Oregon and New England, but particularly California and New York, have adopted the most radical policies now, California is ahead of New York, and what you see in New York is uh, – uh, what you see in California, where they're ahead of the rest of the nation, uh, is that electric rates are going up. And they're now um, quite a lot higher than the national average, and they're still going to keep going up. Uh, and so when people talk about the, uh, uh, the high cost of living in California and that nobody can afford to live there, it's not just housing prices. It's also energy prices. Uh, they have the highest gasoline prices in the nation, typically. Uh, maybe Hawaii and Alaska are, are higher, but uh, the lower 48, California is usually the highest. Um, and so it's very expen- It's becoming very expensive to live there, as, partly as a result of these policies. Now, I'm just looking up um, Myron Ebel, and it says that you were part of the then-Republican uh, presidential candidate Donald Trump's transition team for the EPA. What was that like, if you don't mind me asking? Well, it was uh, it was a great uh, um, privilege and honor to be asked to help uh, uh, get the get the new administration launched. Uh, I worked the the fall and, and early winter of 2016 and January of uh, 2017 with a team of people. It was a volunteer effort, um, and what we tried to do was to translate uh, Mr. Trump's campaign promises into uh, how, how would you actually accomplish these. In government, and um, so it was. It was a challenging, you know, very hectic uh, 
few months to to put together a plan. I I don't you know I can't tell you how uh, closely the EPA has followed the plan that my team and I put together, but I do I can tell you that they they have done quite a good job, and I think the administration overall has done quite a good job keeping uh, Mr. Trump's campaign promises. Whether you agree with them or not, he he has been uh, very insistent that. I made all these promises, and I'm going to keep them. And uh, at EPA, there were a lot of major deregulatory actions that he promised to take. And EPA is in the middle of getting those done. It takes. It, it turns out that it takes just as long to deregulate something as it does to regulate it. You have to go through this, all these steps of an administrative process. But for example, this week, uh, the EPA and the Department of Transportation announced that they are uh, withdrawing the uh, California waiver, which essentially put California in charge of our nation's fuel economy standards for for vehicles. Uh, And they're saying California shouldn't dictate to the rest of the nation. Uh, The federal government should do that. Of course, we don't, we're not that keen on fuel economy standards here at CEI, but as long as they're the law, uh, it's, it's a federal matter, not one state telling all the other states. So that was a Trump campaign promise, and they're keeping it. So, uh, so I, you know, I'm going on too long. No, but you're I, doing I it. Get, this, is, this is great because I feel like not many people are hearing this side of the story anywhere else. So I'm glad I got you on to talk about this because obviously the emission standard, I don't know much about it, but I know that if a state tries to dictate that, that can't be good for anybody. So what he's doing with that is is really remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, he said, I'm going to get rid of the greenhouse gas rules for power plants, um, uh, which are killing uh, the coal industry and uh, uh, making it eventually will raise electric rates. And, you know, he's doing that, uh, that that the EPA is doing that Uh, at the Department of the Interior, which is in charge of the federal lands and and uh, uh, onshore and offshore energy production on federal lands and offshore areas, the Department of the Interior is moving um, expeditiously to uh, to uh, open more land and more offshore areas to oil and gas production. Uh, they've removed the moratorium on coal uh, leasing. And, you know, these uh, the, the federal lands, uh, people out, people in this part of the world forget that out west, uh, more than 50 percent of the land is federally owned. So uh, there's a lot of oil and gas under federal lands. There's a lot offshore uh, uh, along the coast. Uh, up in Alaska, there's a lot. Uh, and so they are, they are uh, again, fulfilling President Trump's promise when, in the campaign that we are going to become America's energy superpower but by unleashing uh, our, our energy industry. And so that's another, I think, uh, important promise that, that uh, is being fulfilled. I've also heard that there are some, you know, reserved reserves on, under the Atlantic Ocean, and no one's tapping into that either. So that they, they have to do all that now. Fracking is is hit or miss, but I feel like there's a lot of benefits to it. I, I might sound a little crazy for saying that, but I feel like fracking we can develop our own resources, and that's that's the ultimate goal, is it not? Well, yes, uh, absolutely, Alex. You know, people, <laughs> there's this mythology that's been created about fracking. Uh, what, what, it, what it means is that uh, conventional oil and gas production is you drill a hole into the ground several thousand feet, and you find a pool that's being held by the rocks above it, and then you pump that pool up and then uh, up uh, to the top of the oil well. Uh, Fracking is a combination of two things. Hydraulic fracturing, which is a, um, a technique of, uh, of increasing uh, the flow rate of, of, a, of a well, which has been used since 1949. It's been done millions of times in this country and all around the world. With horizontal drilling, that is, you drill down and then you drill horizontally. And by combining those two technologies, you, you can actually get oil out of the shale formation, out of the rock. You don't have to find a pool. You can actually get it out of the rock. Now, geologists have known that that a lot of shale formations are full of oil and gas for a long, long time, but 
somebody had to figure out how to get it out. Right. And so these two technologies together, hydraulic fracturing, where you where you um, you have small uh, pops which which uh, which form cracks in the rock, small cr- little cracks, so that the oil can seep out, and horizontal drilling, so that when you find one of these these uh, these shale formations that has the oil in it, you can drill horizontally so you don't have to keep drilling down. So so the the fracking altogether is much less intrusive. Uh, you don't have to drill nearly as many wells. So so the gra- the surface is disturbed much less. The landscape is disturbed much less. And why fracking has become this sort of demon technology, I have no idea. Well, I'll have to ask you this then, because I know that there were earthquakes in Oklahoma or something like that. Mm-hmm. Some say was that was that some say that was part of fracking, but maybe that's not true. Uh, but I know that that was a big thing at one point. Why are all these earthquakes mm-hmm. happening? Well, I, I think they really qualify as tremors. That is very very small earthquakes. Uh, and uh, secondly, I don't think there, I don't think there's any evidence that. Uh, uh, pr- or, uh, shale oil and gas production has caused any major earthquakes. It causes tremors. And I've been told uh, that it's mostly not the actual hydraulic fracturing that does it. It's the disposal underground of the water that's used in the process after it's been used. And by injecting the water back into the ground, that sometimes causes tremors. Now, I, I don't, I can't sort out whether which whether it's the the fracking process or the the reinjection of the water, I don't know. I, I I can't sort that out. But it's it's could be one or the other. It could be both. But it's mostly very minor tremors that are very uh, difficult to uh, feel, but will be picked up by a seismograph. Sure. So um, I, I you know I, again it's one of these things that's uh, maybe a minor annoyance, but it, but. It, it certainly isn't a major annoyance to most people living in Oklahoma. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, th- this mayor and this governor here in New York, just uh, th- they have this whole idea that fracking and other things could harm the environment, but they're just they're just using it to to get more money to shut down companies which should <laughs> be shut down. Well, yes, it's been a big political fight in some states, and uh, I mean, this PowerPoint plan in Green, I think it's Greenpoint. That's a pure example of it, but they should stay open as far as I'm concerned. What do you think? Yes. I, look, I, I think that uh, access to uh, affordable energy is very important. We have huge amounts of energy. We, have, we are the world's energy superpower now, and that's not due to government. I mean, President Trump and his deregulatory actions have allowed it, but, uh, but it's, it's due to, to uh, uh, free enterprise and private companies working in, in the free market. Uh, we have the world's largest reserves of coal. We're now the world's largest producer of oil and natural gas. Uh, and we have uh, tremendous reserves of, of oil and gas. And so um, the idea that we should put that, you know, New York should go on an energy diet uh, and make people poorer uh, by raising energy prices and restricting access to energy. I mean, for example, this idea that you're going to not build a natural gas pipeline so that people, uh, so that the uh, utility can't hook more people up to natural gas. Well, if you build a new house or a new, a new building, that means you're not going to be heated by the most economical, right, and 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 cleanest way to heat a house, which is natural gas. So. I, you know, I, I just don't think energy diets are are that good, and I actually don't think they're that popular. I think, I think there's a lot of um, concealment involved in the consequences of these policies. I don't think the people pushing these policies talk uh, openly with with the public about the the pros and the cons, and the cons are. Uh, you know, how much more do you want to pay for electricity? Do you want to have electric rates double? Uh, do you want to ha- have gasoline prices twice as high? I, you know, I, I, I think you know that's the kind of conversation that would lead to to policies that uh, that people uh, were more were happier with. And and hopefully CEI could drive those conversations because not many 
are driving a conversation toward, hey, these deregulation policies are working and, and all that. We need more of those voices. And now you probably have the analysis on this. Two for one deregulations is what Trump, President Trump came in to do, and he's done them. How much of those regulations have been environmental deregulation? Well, some of the biggest have been environmental, uh, and the EPA so far has done something like 20. They've gotten rid of 20 rules for each new one. But um, the, 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 the savings or the taking away the impediments to economic activity, uh, it's, you know, it's going to be hard to measure. Some of these things take a long time before uh, they they come to fruition, but I do think that the the deregulatory actions that President uh, Trump and his administration have undertaken have have started the process of of turning around investment in our material economy and manufacturing and resource production uh, and agriculture. Uh, but I think there's still a long way to go. I mean, the, the Trump campaign promises were a great start, but we we're, we're I think we need to keep moving in that direction, and of course, that's what uh, we, we uh, here at CEI advocate. So, uh, I, there's a long. It, it's a good start, and I think the economy is turning around. You know, most of the economic growth after the financial crash in 2008, most of it was in on the coast. It was in financial services and Silicon Valley, and uh, it was California and New York. Uh, the last two years, most of the economic growth has been in the heartland states that for the last 20 years have either been stagnant or have been in decline. And the reason is because there's there's now a, 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 the people who have who want to make investments now have a reason to invest in manufacturing um, and in resource production. And so manufacturing, which had been fleeing this country for the last 20 years, mostly to China, is starting to come back to places like Ohio and Indiana and Michigan. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, this is really good news for the country because you don't want to concentrate economic growth just in a couple of places. You want to you want to have the entire American people um, uh, have a chance at, at, at uh, a vibrant, healthy economy. So, I, you know, I think something really good is going on here through the deregulatory actions of the, of the administration. And I, I hope you're getting to still talk to President Trump and Rick Perry, of course, for their work at the EPA, uh, President and Rick Perry. Are you still in contact? Hey, hang, with on. Hang, hang, hang on, Alex. Rick Perry is Secretary of Energy, and Andrew Wheeler is Administrator of the EPA. So... Um, uh, and I, I I know Andrew, and I saw him at the California waiver event on uh, uh, Thursday. So, uh, well, and that's uh, well, he's he's doing a good job then at the EPA with what they're what they're trying to accomplish. Now, one more thought as we're talking, it just popped in my head. What have you been following the National Grid story with Cuomo? That fight, have you followed that at all? Um, not. Not enough to to say anything useful without probably saying something that's wrong. So I think I'll I'll pass on that. I just know that there's still a bit of a fight between him and Cuomo. Just thought might have thought. All right. So back to the final point, though. The doomsdayers have been wrong, and Myron Ebo points that out in the Washington Examiner through CEI. And do you think they're going to just continue to be wrong? I guess my final question. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, the the uh, I, I think people can judge by by reading our the examples that we've we've posted on our website and then I discussed in, some of them I discussed in the Washington Examiner. Uh, you know the kinds of predictions that that people started to make in the 1960s, uh, starting with this idea that the world was overpopulated and we were going to run out of food, and then moving to global cooling, and then now moving to global warming, they're all so similar. Um, and they've all been wrong. So the question is, if they've been wrong for 50 years, are the same kinds of predictions likely to be true now? Um, and my bet is that they're not, but I can't prove that. Uh, but my guess is that uh, just as the, the, the doom, doom mongers and doomsters were wrong in the 60s and 70s, they're just as wrong now in the teens of the 21st century. And it's amazing how history is repeating itself. And I'm sure you've been against the global warming argument for a long time. 
uh, during those years as well, right? Uh, well, yes, I've, I've been fighting for for sensible energy policies in it and against global warming alarmism now since about 1997. So it's it's a long slog. Well, can we have you back on to discuss what happens at the U.N. next week? I'm sure you'll be following. The whole world will be following at that point. So let's bring you back on to discuss it. I'd like to, Alex. Thank you. Thank you you so much. That was Myron Ebel of the CI uh, Energy, and he's the director. Let me get this right, Myron. You are the... There we go. You are the director of Center for Energy and Environment Competitive Enterprise Institute. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Now, one last story, and uh, partly why I play Bronx is Burning. John Keenan, he was the son of Sam Detective, died. Keenan took part in the arrest and investigation of son of Sam in 1977. And he died yesterday at the age of eighteen, uh, at the age of ninety nine. So thank you, John Keenan, for your service. And of course, coast to coast, former host Arbel passing away on Friday the thirteenth. As wild as the show was, as Michael Harrison put it in Talkers, it's fitting he would pass on during during. Uh, September 13th, Friday the 13th. So we will miss both of them, and both have made such an impact. I'm Alexander Garrett. Let's see if the Yanks stay hot. Let's see if the mayor goes to the stadium for the playoffs. And let's see if we can continue to deregulate and put less strain on energy in our country. Thanks to Myron Ebel for joining me on the fly today here on Keeping It Real with Alexander Garrett.